Hello everybody, my name is Mohanad Sari. Today we'll be discussing left anterior fascicular block and left posterior fascicular block and bifascicular block. We've already discussed right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block in a previous lecture, but I'll summarize real quick. When the QRS complex is normal, the duration is less than 0.1 milliseconds, which is less than two and a half small squares. For the QRS to be narrow, depolarization must proceed through the AV node, through the right bundle and left bundles, through the Hispericici system, and depolarize both ventricles simultaneously. That creates a narrow QRS. In the setting of left bundle branch block, depolarization will spread through the right bundle and then slowly depolarize the left ventricle via muscle-to-muscle -muscle conduction, which is a slow process. This will widen the QRS and shift the overall vector to the left side, creating a negative complex in lead V1 and a positive complex in lead V6. In right bundle branch block, depolarization will proceed normally down the left bundle. However, the terminal portion of the QRS will consist of depolarization of the right ventricle through myocyte to myocyte conduction, which is a slow process, creating a terminal positive deflection in lead V1, giving you an RSR prime complex that looks like a rabbit ears, and giving you a terminal negative S wave in lead V6. Now let's discuss what happens if specific fascicles within the left bundle get blocked. So instead of complete left bundle branch block, you get left anterior fascicular block or left posterior fascicular block. Now the left bundle is classically described as consisting of a left anterior fascicle, which supplies the anterolateral portion of the left ventricle, and a left posterior fascicle, which supplies the inferoceptal portion of the left ventricle. It's slightly more complicated than that, and there is fanning of the left bundle. However, this anatomical model is useful for understanding what's happening on the ECG. Now, it's important to note that with either left anterior fascicular block or left posterior fascicular block, because there is still partial depolarization through the Hesperkiji system in the left ventricle, the QRS is not as wide as a true left bundle branch block. In fact, it shouldn't be. It may be slightly prolonged, so between 80 milliseconds and 110 milliseconds, but it shouldn't reach 120 milliseconds, so three small squares. In the case of left anterior fascicular block, because electrical depolarization is blocked along the left anterior fascicle, depolarization will move normally through the right bundle and the left posterior fascicle, creating an initial positive deflection in leads 2, 3, and AVF, and an initial negative deflection in lead 1 and AVL, mainly because of septal and inferior wall depolarization through the left posterior fascicle. However, because the anterolateral part of the ventricle is no longer supplied by the Hispericici system, there is slow muscle-to-muscle -muscle depolarization of that portion proceeding towards the top left, and this shifts the vector of depolarization towards the top left, creating left axis deviation. This will show up as a deep S wave in leads 2, 3, and AVF, and a tall R wave in leads 1 and AVL. This is an example of left anterior fascicular block. As you can see, lead 1 is positive and lead 2 is negative, indicating left axis deviation. We've discussed how to determine the axis in a previous lecture. However, when lead 1 is positive, the depolarization vector points to the left side of the heart, and when lead 2 is negative, the axis depolarization points towards the top right portion of the heart. The overlap between both of them is minus 30 to minus 90 degrees, and hence the axis is shifted leftwards. The actual criteria for left anterior fascicular block is left axis deviation. Usually this is extreme between minus 45 degrees to minus 90 degrees. There is a small Q and a large R complex in leads 1 and AVL, as you can see. And there's a small R and large S complex in leads 2, 3, and AVF. Again, this small R wave in leads 2, 3, and AVF is generated by the initial depolarization through the left posterior fascicle. Now, this is very important to distinguish from another common cause of left axis deviation, which is an inferior wall myocardial infarction. If the inferior wall is infarcted because of a previous heart attack, then there is scarring of the bottom part of the heart, which reduces electrical forces going towards the inferior wall. This creates a Q wave or the absence of the R wave in the inferior leads. And what you'll see is Q waves in 2, 3 and AVF with no initial R deflection. This is why it's important to have a small R wave in leads 2, 3 and AVF because in the setting of an inferior infarct, which can also cause left axis deviation, that small R wave does not exist, and you begin with a Q wave. Now, with a left posterior fascicular block, depolarization does not proceed down the left posterior fascicle, but instead, it proceeds down the right bundle and the left anterior fascicle. This creates an initial small Q wave in leads 2, 3, and AVF, as the anterolateral portion of the left ventricle depolarizes away from the inferior leads and towards one in AVL, also creating a small R wave in leads 1 and AVL. 
However, now there is slow depolarization down towards the inferoceptum part of the left ventricle, shifting the axis towards the bottom right, creating an S wave in leads 1 and AVL and an R wave in leads 2, 3 and AVF. And here you see an example of left posterior fascicular block. Again, the cuirass is not very wide, so it's less than three small squares. Lead one is negative and lead two is positive, indicating right axis deviation. Because lead one is negative, the vector of depolarization is proceeding left to right. And because lead two is positive, it's proceeding towards the bottom left with an overlap between 90 degrees and 150 degrees. Here's the criteria of left posterior fascicular block. There is right axis deviation, so the axis is more than 90 degrees. You must exclude other causes of right axis deviation, such as right ventricular hypertrophy, before you diagnose left posterior fascicular block. There is a small R and a large S complex in lead 1 and AVL, and there is a small Q and a large R complex in lead 2, 3 and AVF. This is important to distinguish from another cause of right axis deviation, which is a lateral wall myocardial infarction. When there is a lateral wall myocardial infarction, there is scarring on the lateral wall of the heart, which reduces the electrical vector moving from right to left. This creates absence of the initial R wave in leads 1 and AVL, or a Q wave in leads 1 and AVL. And here you see a patient with an old lateral infarct with no R wave in leads 1 and AVL, and simply starting with a Q wave. This is important to distinguish an old lateral myocardial infarction from left posterior fascicular block. Now that we've discussed the criteria for left anterior and left posterior fascicular block, it's important to note that both these conduction abnormalities do widen the QRS slightly by about 20 to 30 milliseconds. However, it does not reach 120 milliseconds or three small squares like true bundle branch block. Now, where it gets tricky is sometimes right bundle branch block could occur concomitantly with left anterior fascicular block and left posterior fascicular block and we call that bifascicular block. So how do we distinguish bifascicular block from standard right bundle branch block? Well, it's important to note, as we mentioned before, that right bundle branch block does not shift the axis. Because the axis is mainly determined by the muscle of the left ventricle, the axis in right bundle branch block is usually normal, with leads one and two being positive. Now, when you have right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block, depolarization is blocked down the, the right bundle and the left anterior fascicle and only proceeds down the left posterior fascicle. This creates slow abnormal depolarization towards the rest of the ventricle, the anterolateral part of the ventricle, and towards the right ventricle. And effectively, this will cause a right bundle branch block pattern like we see in typical right bundle branch block in lead V1, where you see an RSR prime, so rabbit ears in lead V1, but now the axis is shifted leftwards, and you see a small Q and a large R in lead V1, and a small R and a large S in lead 2, just like you would with left anterior fascicular block on its own. So combining both criteria, R, S, R prime in V1, a broad S in V6 for the right bundle, and left axis deviation with a small Q in lead 1 and a small R in lead 2, now we have right bundle branch block with left anterior fascicular block. Similarly, if you have right bundle branch block and left posterior fascicular block, conduction will proceed normally down the left anterior fascicle, and now the rest of the left ventricular muscle towards the inferoceptum and the right ventricle will both depolarize slowly through muscle-to-muscle -muscle depolarization, which is a slow process. This will give you a right bundle branch block looking pattern in lead V1 and V6, so an RSR prime in V1 and a broad S wave in V6, and it will also cause right axis deviation with lead 1 being negative, lead 2 being positive, with a small r in lead v1 and a small q in lead 2. And so you have the criteria for right bundle branch block and left posterior fascicular block at the same time. So in summary, both left anterior fascicular block and left posterior fascicular block will both cause slight increased duration of the QRS, but less than 120 milliseconds or three small square. In left anterior fascicular block, there is extreme left axis deviation, a small Q and a large R complex in leads 1 and AVL, a small R and a large S complex in lead 2, 3 and AVF. In left posterior fascicular block, there is right axis deviation, there is a small R and a large S complex in lead 1 and AVL, and a small Q and a large R complex in lead 2, 3 and AVF. And remember that right bundle branch block can coexist with left anterior fascicular block or left posterior fascicular block. Thank you very much and I hope that was useful.